I'm Sharon Alvarez, and uh, we're going to be talking today, uh, like Brian mentioned, about how we can break silos in organizations between product management and development. Okay, so um, a little bit about me. Uh, I, I spent uh, a large part of my career in Europe, actually. I worked uh, for 10 different countries across Europe, uh, uh, Asia, and America. Uh, in Europe, I work for a large uh, governmental organization, such as the UN, UNESCO. I had an engagement with Interpol as well. I work for Christie's International, and then for a few banks, like the BNP Paribas and uh, New York Stock Exchange when they merged with uh, Euronext in Europe. So I worked across uh, d diverse industries in Europe, and then I worked uh, in the US. So I've been uh, in Seattle for about 10 years, and I studied uh, an MBA when I, when I came here, and I took a job at Amazon. So at Amazon, I was actually joined the Kindle periodical when they had just started. The, the books were running really well, but the periodical had just started for about a year. And um, so I will talk to you about that experience. I worked at Microsoft for about uh, a little bit less than five years with different groups. Uh, uh, I worked on a really cool project, which was a speech IVR for Netflix. Uh, so we were developing an IVR application for Netflix. This was really cool. And I worked with diverse groups, such as the global BI ops, uh, global marketing, and also actually global HR operations. Uh, then I moved on to uh, Expedia. And because I had acquired a lot of experience in uh, data-driven environments, uh, at Expedia, I worked with the uh, data booking engineering team. And I'll talk about that experience as well. And I spent uh, less than two years at BCU. It was a great experience as well. I will talk to you about some of the practices I introduced at BCU. And I've been at T-Mobile for less than two years. Uh, it's, it's been a great experience. Uh, so T-Mobile is going under a really large uh, digital transformation. And I work for corporate services, and I support their uh, enterprise agile and digital transformation. OK, that's about my background. So outside of work, uh, I'm also uh, very active in the global community. So I'm, a, I'm an editor and a news reporter for InfoQ. It's a really cool um, uh, online uh, magazine and newspaper, actually, that publishes a lot of uh, articles, uh, magazines, and um, news about uh, product management, agile, DevOps. Uh, so I'm an editor and news reporter for methods and culture, and sometimes for DevOps. And I'm also a speaker, so I'm going to be speaking at two uh, global uh, conferences uh, coming up in uh, October and November. The first one is a DevOps Enterprise Summit, so how companies can scale DevOps. It's a huge challenge in organizations. And the other one is all day DevOps. So our takeaways tonight, I really want to make that session uh, um, uh, useful for you. So I'm targeting two uh, key takeaways. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but I really would like you to leave the rooms learning these two things, learning about those, those two things. Uh, the first one is uh, how um, agile product management uh, practices can help you break down the silos between product management and development, and what are those practices. So I will give you uh, uh, real practices that I uh, implemented in all of those companies that work really well and that were very successful in bridging the gap, the collaboration and communication between those two groups. And then uh, I want you to learn about uh, skills, uh, product management skills that are not directly related to actually product management, uh, such as uh, uh, market research, impact assessment, uh, feasibility, and so on, but more organizational type of skills. What is uh, uh, sought after uh, in organizations that are going through large digital transformation? So I will mention some of those skills that are very valuable. Okay. Voila, so the agenda, uh, I want to uh, spend some time on the problem statement, understanding what uh, silos are and uh, um, how we can break those silos in organizations. So we'll cover 
uh, what I mean by breaking down silos between uh, product management and development, what those silos are, what are the silos I'm talking about, and uh, uh, about, about the silos, uh, uh, how do we create those silos, how do they get created, and how it's important for me to be aware uh, about how those silos get created because we can actually be uh, more uh, proactive about breaking down those silos, understanding where they are, and also avoiding creating additional silos or sustaining those, right? And uh, then we'll look at the speed and value-driven uh, agile product management practices, like I mentioned, uh, that I applied in all those companies, okay? And uh, we'll deep dive, I do want to deep dive in some of them and give you some examples. And we'll finish by uh, the skills uh, that can help you uh, thrive, design, not only thrive, but design effective organizations and thrive in really large corporations. So um, every organization today and large organizations are confronted with two challenges. They are focused on two key um, objectives. The first one is a speed to market. We all want to beat the competition and the speed to market, uh, the lead time and cycle times are really important, right? So the next thing, uh, the second item that's really on everybody's mind is innovation. So developing a, pro a product backlog, enhancement and so on is absolutely necessary. We, have all, we always have business as usual work to do. But organizations are looking for the next big thing, the, the next uh, innovation that's going to disrupt the industry, right? So how do we uh, uh, achieve a speed to market and uh, innovation, uh, which requires a lot of collaboration in a world of silos? So this is a problem statement. So, and to look at that, uh, I think it's really important to understand, for the flow to understand the, the challenges in the flow of value and how we can uh, achieve speed, it's really important to understand the flow of value. And um, so, uh, to visualize the flow of value and understand what are the impediments, what are the challenges across that flow of value from idea to feedback. So you probably heard of the flow of value between idea and uh, cash. And what I'm interested in, I'm going a step further, I'm interested in the feedback. That feedback is really important. It's for me, it's actually the most important. And I'm going to be talking about some practices around feedback velocity. So it's not selling a product, it's getting the feedback from the customer and plugging that feedback back into the product backlog. That's really important. And we can do that across the flow of the product management lifecycle, okay? So the first step to do, and this is what we call in Lean Agile value stream mapping, uh, the first, what I've done, I've actually uh, mapped out uh, some of the key phases in product management uh, lifecycle, okay? So depending on organization, that flow can be different. Those phases may have different names and so on. I try to be as detailed as possible so that you may be able to recognize your own uh, organization. So uh, I've uh, mapped, out, uh, I ma mapped out a request, uh, the moment when we, we receive a request from the business uh, uh, stakeholders, or the moment when we have an idea within our organization, then we have a, a phase called ideation, discovery, it can be called differently, followed by assessment, analysis, design, feasibility requirements, planning before it gets handed off to the DevOps team, and the launch, telemetry, and feedback, because that's really important, and then uh, maturation of the product, okay? So those are common uh, phases. Um, and then I identified some of the roles, the most common roles I have seen in the organization I worked at, okay? So the most common roles, we have the product manager, uh, the SMEs, the UX designer, we have managers contributing to that effort, technical product manager, domain architect, sometimes just an, an architect, system analyst, dev leads, project manager, product owner as well, and the delivery team, okay? So you can see that there's a lot of roles, and I have been in organization where we have all of those roles working together. So it's a lot of different roles involved in just product management, right? So sometimes overlapping, sometimes creating friction, and I'll cover that. 
So, and those are just the role across technology. So those are the, just the role across IT that we see in IT or in solution delivery or technology. And now we have, I collaborate with similar roles on the business side. So I have business analysts, I have uh, sometimes even uh, product managers on the business side that work with all product managers. So it creates a, a lot of interesting collaboration and um, uh, challenges as well. So the next, the next steps so when we do a value stream mapping, when we try to identify the flow of value and understand what are the challenges, the delays, is to map out, is to identify actually or break down all the activities that we do in what we call value add activities and then non value add activities, right? And it's, we, the reason why we do that is to understand where are the delays. And again, if we want to speed our time to market, isn't it important to understand what our velocity is at the first place? When we don't know what our velocity is, how long it takes for us to deliver a product from idea to feedback, how do we know that we are actually improving on that uh, time to market, right? So um, we break down all those activities into value add. So the value add are generally targeted towards uh, uh, deliverables. So concept brief, uh, market research, documentation, impact assessment. So prototyping, it's a more uh, tangible uh, item, backlog, the product backlog, the features and functionalities themselves. And in the non-value add activities, we often have uh, waste, what we call also wasteful activities. They, they support all of the work, uh, but they don't add that value directly to, to the product. So meetings, emails, negotiation, wait time, uh, calling a vendor, waiting on a vendor, and so on, uh, waiting for fundings, approvals, uh, figuring out issues, forming teams, uh, all those activities are uh, less, di less directly related to the, to the product value. So few observations, I want to call out and bring, bring your attention to few observations here. Uh, what we can see is uh, a lot of those activities, we have generally more roles on product management, right? And then those activities are more researched and assessment based. So they are more people centric. They require more work from uh, people, interaction, collaboration. And they are more creative, more based on negotiations, trade offs. And that, 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 that uh, category of work is considered more uncertain. And therefore, the delays are less controllable, right? We have to wait on people. That side of the work, when we get into delivery and DevOps, is more orchestrated, is more scripted, is more coded. And hopefully, it's, more, it's, it's actually more automated. Hopefully, it's automated, right? So if it's automated, the work is more predictable, the delays are more predictable, and the time to resolution are more predictable. So, and this is one of the reasons I want to say we track team's velocity, right? Teams are requested to maintain their velocity, all the DevOps team, and we track their velocity. Some organizations track their velocity as well as the, the hours on the task. So we, uh, capture the, we capture the time that we spend on the task. And, but we don't actually, it's very difficult to, to capture the lead time, cycle time of that part of the work. And in many organizations I worked at, I have a clear uh, visibility on the velocity, on the DevOps team's velocity, but we don't have a great visibility on the lead time on the product management side, okay? So um, I see two opportunities uh, in, uh, in that, uh, this way of working. The first opportunity is uh, in order to achieve speed and time to market and innovation is to, uh, we want to reduce that time to value, right? So the, one of the greatest opportunity here is to uh, uh, increase the collaboration between uh, product management and development team break down some silos and bring the development team earlier in the process of defining the requirements instead of later in the process. And I'll walk you through some examples. 
the other uh, 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 aspect I see is uh, so breaking down the, the, that huge uh, silo between uh, product management and development, bringing them uh, earlier in the process. And the second one is uh, reducing that the time spent in pro product management. So it doesn't mean working faster. It doesn't mean um, uh, skipping some of those really important steps, right? Uh, global market research and so on. It's really important to do all that. It's just bringing people in a room together instead of working in silo and handing off work to the next person. Okay, so those are the two important uh, opportunities that I see. So silos, organizational silos. So I'm talking a lot about organizational silos and I think it's important to understand what I mean by that. We, a lot, all of our organizations have different type of silos, right? Uh, organizational, role-based, uh, there are silos that I'm sure we don't see. Um, so I wanted to uh, look at few of them to understand how we can break those down and also to understand how, they, how we create those silos. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, business versus technology. So you probably uh, saw, or uh, as you work in organization, you probably see that there is a different, different ways of working. There are different ways of working between those two organizations within the same company. And often there's different culture even between those two groups, right? The way we function and so on. And um, one thing I, I forgot to mention to you uh, when, when, we, when we looked at my career and the work I've done in those, those companies, in all of those companies, I was working as an agile coach. Um, so I think that's important because I wasn't a product manager, although sometimes I had to uh, fill uh, the role of a project ma product manager that, wasn't, uh, that had to leave. And I worked very closely with development teams. So as an agile coach, uh, I worked across uh, business and development uh, all the time for the last 10 years. Even if sometimes I was embedded in uh, development teams, I interacted a lot with the business. And I worked at enterprise level. So it had brought me to be really familiar with uh, uh, engaging with a lot of different people across an organization and understanding where they come from, uh, having uh, awareness about those silos, different ways of engaging. And uh, that's the reason I try to uh, uh, bridge that gap, actually. That's the reason why I really try in all of my engagement, the work I do, to bring people along and, and break down the silos. So one of the key silos I wanted to mention is business versus technology. So there's a, a survey uh, that version one released uh, every year for the last 10 years. It's the state of agile. And uh, every year, and it's probably it's, it's been released now. So the state of agile, and for the last ten years, they identify why companies are moving to agile. What are the reasons? What are the motivation for moving to agile and for scaling agile? And the next thing they are measuring, and they are measuring a lot of different uh, uh, aspects of agile transformation. But I want to uh, pause on those two. And the next thing, they are measuring uh, the top uh, impediments, the top challenges uh, when they move to Agile. And it's very, very interesting because one of the top three reasons why organizations move to Agile, want to transition to Agile delivery, is because they want to bridge the silo, the gap between business and technology, the misalignment and miscommunication between business and uh, technology. And that's for the last 10 years. And then when we look at the top three reasons uh, that uh, impeding that transformation is actually the cultural difference and uh, the, between the business and technology. And we can see when we look at the numbers and the percentage improvement, you can see, we can see that it's, it didn't improve very much. So we still, uh, in a lot of organizations, we still struggle with that, the misalignment between business and technology. Okay, then the next uh, silo that's very interesting as well, and it ha it's um, related to innovation, it's technology versus technology. So I worked in, uh, in companies, uh, in, uh, in France actually, as well as uh, in the US, uh, where it's actually not uncommon to see a developer's team uh, uh, work on the same problem, right? They are, we are in the same company but we're trying to solve for the same problem. 
in different groups, and we come up with different applications, with different software, but we're solving for the same problem. And that's simple, simply because we don't know what we're working on. You know, so we, and there was a, an important effort at Microsoft to rationalize, uh, not centralize, but I want to say rationalize applications uh, when Satya Nadella actually became a CEO. And that campaign was called One Microsoft. It was a cultural transformation, but it was also one of the objective was to rationalize our application. And I was working on uh, some of those applications actually. And uh, I was with the marketing group at that time, uh, uh, Global Marketing. And we, ha we started developing an, a central application within Microsoft that would rationalize, that would actually uh, combine almost all of the marketing applications. So it's called IMP, Integrated Marketing Platform. So um, we have uh, those examples in organization where we work on, this, on solving the same problem, same type of product, and we develop different applications. Okay, so another silo is the role, I think we talked about a little bit, uh, between product managers, technical managers, technical product managers, and then product owners. So I do work in organization where we see all of those roles. They have different responsibilities uh, across that uh, uh, value stream mapping, across that flow, but there's overlap and uh, collaboration and sometimes uh, friction, okay? So um, another one that's interesting is performance metrics. So you, you will notice that business, uh, when we work with the business, we measure a certain type of uh, business metrics. But when we work in software development, we measure a different type of business metrics, right? And there's not often, which is fine, but there's not often a lot of communication with the development team to help them understand the business metrics. So they report out on engineering, DevOps, and so on but there's not a lot of uh, uh, effort to bring them along to understand the business metrics. So it's okay to have different set of metrics, but I think some organizations started actually educating development and bringing, bringing them along with the business and working them along with the business on meeting some business KPI, some business metrics. Okay, so I read a lot and uh, recently I read a quote and I can't remember which uh, article, but I want to finish by that organizational silo. I read, regardless of size, every enterprise is now a software company. And I think you read that a lot, right? In the last 10 years, I, I heard that a lot. Uh, uh, every company uh, want to become a software company, want to be seen as a software organization, right? And I remember Starbucks uh, a little while ago, they declared it's a retail company, coffee company, right, uh, with a great culture. And they declare that they want it to be seen as a software development company. So it's very interesting to see how software development is something that, you know, uh, was very attractive, is still very attractive. So that's also, from my perspective, that's also a silo. It's a way of seeing an entire organization. I don't believe that an organization is just a software development uh, organization, right? I think first and, for, uh, first and foremost, what we want to do is develop products, products that you know, attract uh, customers, products that disrupt uh, industry. So um, it's not product versus software development. I think it's, it's important to uh, uh, look at an organi organization with a holistic uh, perspective. It's really both. So that quote is actually a good segue to go into the next um, slide uh, and uh, how we create silos. So I'm a big fan of uh, the Agile Manifesto and uh, of uh, Scrum and the Scrum Guide. And uh, I did an interview of Jeff Sutherland, who is the founder actually of uh, the Agile Manifesto. A great interview that was published on InfoQ. So I'm a really big fan of the manifesto. But I want to say that the Agile Manifesto is called um, Manifesto for Agile Software Development, right? It's not called the Manifesto for Product and Software Development or for Product Development, it's for Software Development. And for the last 18 years, it was published actually in 2001, and it was written by a group of uh, 17 uh, men 
all software developers and they haven't included anybody, any business stakeholders, they haven't included uh, you know, anybody from program management specifically, they haven't included anybody from research and development, from marketing, merchandising, R&D, and it was really a group of software developers, which is great, and I think their objective was to solve for software development uh, uh, challenges at that time. And, but what it created, it really created a software development culture and bubble within organization. And I think we forgot to include all those uh, practices and functions back. And only recently, not recently, but in the, ne in the last few years, we started talking about BIS DevOps, for example, or uh, DevSecOps, security and op operation. So you can see that we started re-including those, uh, those, those functions. And in some organization, it's still difficult. I, I, I listened to a conference uh, last year, um, the DevOps Enterprise Summit, and there was a consultant who presented the challenges that uh, uh, functions outside of uh, product management and software development have has because they are not included actually in agile transformation and so on. And, and there's a really disconnect between all those functions and product development. So the next silo uh, uh, that's really interesting to notice or a cultural aspect of uh, organization is the Scrum Guide. And that one would be interesting for you. Um, it, uh, Scrum started in 1993 really the practice, the idea, the philosophy started in 1993. But the, the Scrum Guide itself, the first edition, was written in 2001. And uh, so since uh, 2001, uh, we, oh, actually it's 2010, I think. Since uh, 2001 or 10, I forgot, I'll confirm that. Uh, we heard the business, we're hearing the business is responsible for the what, and development is responsible for the how, which means, and I hear that constantly when I facilitate uh, retrospectives. I, I don't anymore, but one of the uh, source of friction, for example, between our product manager, product owner, and development team is the development teams really uh, prefer that the business focuses only on the what they want. So what features, what functionalities, we want them to prioritize them, but we really don't like it when they chime into how they want it to be delivered, right? And that happens often. So that, the, the Scrum Guide is very focused on uh, roles and processes and practices across product management and development. The focus is very much on roles, so it describes the, the different roles, the services of those roles to each other. But I feel that it's not looking at the flow of value across the, all those roles. It's very uh, siloed, actually. And there's clear responsibilities, and there are clear boundaries between those roles. So another really inter interesting um, silo or organizational challenge, and I, I think it's, that one is really, really interesting, is the Conway, Conway Law. Have you heard of the Conway Law? Anyone? Okay, so it's a law that was established by uh, Conway, actually, and I highly recommend you to look into it in order to understand uh, how organizations uh, are structured and the impact of organizational structure on our products, actually on the products that we deliver. So it's, uh, he, he, he established, uh, he came up with strong evidence that support the hypothesis that product architecture mirrors the structure of an organization. So a product architecture, a, the result of a product, mirror uh, the communication structure and uh, uh, um, architecture structure of an organization. Because of how it's structured, because of the people who work in those groups and in those organizations. So there's lots of literature about that uh, that you can uh, access online. In 2011, there was a very interesting uh, uh, study and research published by uh, Harvard Business Review, and I'll give you the, the reference, uh, that uh, supports uh, those evidence. So uh, it, that confirmed the Conway Law uh, study and evidences. 
And Microsoft Research has, uh, it's the research branch at Microsoft. They published a study in 2015, it's more recent. And it's really interesting because it supports, they have evidence that shows that the defects, not the product this time, but the defects in organizations actually have a direct relationship with the group of in which uh, the defects are um, uh, identified. So the type of defects, the density of the defects, uh, not the quality, but really the, the, the type of defects. So it's a research that was published in 2015. So we can see that all the organization structure, the way people work, uh, has an impact on uh, products. And then it's the way we process information, right? It's uh, easier for us to break down information into smaller pieces rather than uh, look at it in a look at the big picture. So it's much easier. Uh, we also uh, have um, misconceptions, labels, and uh, we come with our own unconscious bias. So I can give you an example um, uh, as it pertains to role. Uh, I mentioned that I'm an agile coach, right? I work as an agile coach across multiple groups. Uh, and it's very interesting because uh, people see me differently depending on where they are. So I've been called a product coach when, when I work really closely with the business. I've been called a scrum master or technical scrum master when I work really closely with development teams. I was embedded with teams and or sometimes I'm called agile transformation coach. So depending on who you work with, we have those misconceptions, those perceptions and, and we interact with those. So we need to be mindful that we interact with those. The other thing sometimes uh, we don't feel comfortable or we don't even think about including someone in a meeting, for example, you know, when, when you have a business meeting or meeting around product management, we don't think about including a, a domain architect, for example, because it's an architect, when actually it could drive a lot of value. It could speed gathering information, it could speed the brainstorming process, it could speed the ideation process. And it could speed just making decision because we have somebody technical attending that meeting, right? So those are the things uh, I, I think it's really important to be aware of. Okay, so value, uh, speed and value-driven agile product development practice. So uh, I've been uh, uh, working uh, across multiple groups and organizations and there are practices that I have uh, um, uh, rolled out or leverage uh, very often to bridge that uh, communication and collaboration between the different groups I interact with and very successfully. So uh, some of those, I highlighted some of those in, in blue, so inception and discovery workshop. So it's a really powerful uh, practice and workshop that you can leverage and I highly encourage you to look into. Uh, to bring people together, uh, look at a new idea, uh, investigate together uh, the feasibility of that idea. Uh, then we have value stream mapping. I, sh I showed you a little bit about value stream mapping when we started, and I'm, I'll, I'll talk about the value stream mapping at Amazon. Uh, product retrospective. We hear a lot about team retrospectives, right? But I have led a product retrospective, so product launch retrospective at uh, Amazon. And we did that across the entire uh, cycle of the, the product. Um, and with all the stakeholders who were involved in uh, launching that product. So it was a very, very beneficial. Big room retrospective, story mapping, feedback velocity. So there are a lot of, uh, there's a, a huge panoply of uh, practices, agile practices that you can uh, learn about and you can uh, deploy and support across your organization. What they all have in common, most of them, is that they are highly, highly collaborative. So collaboration is really at the heart of uh, what I do. And they are, they are highly collaborative. They, re, they, um, they, they demand that people meet in person, work together, which is a different way of working, right, for some organization. So it's actually not easy to introduce them in some organizations, and I'll give you some examples. But there are some organizations that are actually extremely interested, extremely open. Uh, I work with uh, senior directors who were very familiar with Agile and who were very interested, actually, in uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, experimenting with those uh, practices. Okay, so it does reduce the time to market, the time we spend between idea and uh, feedback. And, but what I want to mention, we still have uh, what we call wasteful activities such as meetings, emails, negotiation, and wait time in particular, okay? So let's look at, uh, I, I, um, I organized, I grouped those uh, practices into uh, three categories. Uh, uh, practices around, uh, that helps decreasing time to market. Then we look at uh, what we call uh, practices that uh, uh, help uh, with feedback velocity. So feedback velocity, feedback is really important. And then um, we look at uh, continuous improvement and learning practices across the end-to-end -end product life cycle. Okay, so uh, decreasing time to market, uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's something really important that we all want to do, right? We want to deliver faster. But faster doesn't mean working faster, right? It's not, we're not uh, looking at uh, asking people to work faster or it's really working smarter. So some of the examples uh, that uh, I rolled out uh, that are available to you, and by all means, this is not an exhaustive list, right? I highly encourage you to look into those and to look for other practices. But inception and discovery workshop, uh, value stream mapping, story mapping, Big room planning is one of them. Uh, MVP, so the MVP, it's really an important concept. And the activities that we can deploy in order to uh, find an MVP, identify an MVP faster, but also to deliver it to market faster. And then uh, gacking, testing, um, and so on. So um, at uh, Amazon, when I joined Amazon, uh, I joined the Kindle periodicals and they had just started actually uh, less than a year when I joined. The books were uh, uh, very uh, mature, but periodical had just started. So they were functioning like a start, a little bit like a startup organization and they had a lot of uh, challenges in the end-to-end -end, uh, delivery of uh, their content, especially content integration into um, Kindle. So we were releasing actually uh, international magazines or even national magazines through Kindle, okay? And um, when I joined on the first day, actually, my manager uh, shared all those challenges with me and uh, asked me, so what do, what do we do? <laughs> it was uh, not my first day, it was actually my first hour. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> How do we go up? What, what, what do I have to do? He asked me, it was very interesting. So I started investigating, meeting with people. I asked him, okay, I just need one contact. Uh, who would be my first contact? Who, who, I, how do I, who do I start with, right? So he gave me a contact in, uh, in uh, legal, which was uh, very interesting. And I started with legal. I met with legal. I, started, I tried to understand, okay, what are the challenges? Uh, and uh, I had to figure out all that information, at least the first uh, uh, level of investigation. So what we were interested in, what we were trying to do is understand what are the steps, the processes, exactly like I showed you, you know, the different phases to deliver a product. What are all the phases that we have to go through, the steps, the milestone, and so on? From the time we sign a, a publication with a, an international publisher or national publisher, from the time we shake hands with them until the time we deploy their content into a true Kindle periodical, right? So what are the steps? What, what is the flow? Who are the people engaged? And also, what's the lead time? How long does it take? And uh, why is it taking so long? So uh, I could have proceeded, like I mentioned to you, by meeting one person at a time, right? Legal, finance, accounting, merchandising, and so on. But my objective was, one, to find, uh, to uncover the problems as soon as possible and help decrease that uh, lead time. So I, I, I introduced actually value stream mapping. I had to investigate first, meet with some key stakeholders, right? And I put everybody in a room. And uh, usually we do that in one day or two days. It's a large workshop. It needs to be very well prepared. So there there's needs to have some conversation before, but I, uh, I did it in uh, several sessions. Uh, it's difficult to get everybody in a room, and especially that many stakeholders, right? 
So I, I get everybody in the room and we value stream mapped actually the end-to-end -end process. And then I had an understanding already and I was able to ask them questions and we were able to identify all the problems, the gaps, the delays, why we had so many delays. We had, uh, so something interesting, uh, we were releasing content for a publisher, but that publisher didn't get paid any royalties for several months. So there was a lot of challenges like that. And we were able to uncover all of that because we had all the stakeholders in the room figuring out those problems and trying to understand why is it that I don't get my information on time and so on. So. Um, after that workshop, there was a lot of homework on my part because I needed to map that, that out, communicate that with everybody and come up with solutions, right? So value stream mapping and having people in the same room looking at the value flow together, not only uh, uh, help understand what the problems are, the gaps, but I want to say it also helped us streamline that process and eliminate steps that were unnecessary, redundancies, and so on. So that was very, very valuable. Another practice uh, that's really, uh, really valuable for product managers uh, is uh, inception and discovery workshop and story mapping. So if you remember when we talked about the different phases from idea or request submission, then you have the assessment phase, uh, you have uh, a feasibility phase, requirements, and planning phase, and so on. That, that, that part of the, the product management uh, assessment can take weeks to months, actually. In, I've been in an organization where it takes actually months before we get funding and before we can have requirements to give to the DevOps team, right? So what I have done uh, when I joined T-Mobile, um, it was uh, last year, early last year, I introduced inception and discovery workshop. So it was more a discovery workshop and an attempt to uh, help uh, the product management team to uh, start looking at the requirements together across all the roles involved and involve the, the development team as well. So this, we didn't start from scratch. We didn't start from, from the idea. And I did actually start from an idea at uh, Expedia with a smaller group. But in that situation, we didn't start from scratch. So we had already project managers and business analysts who had done some investigation and research. And, but they, they were struggling in, um, in the next steps, actually uh, getting uh, the next uh, group of people, such as product managers, product owners, uh, product owners and uh, SMEs, and also developers and dev lead in the process. It wasn't easy to understand what would be the next step. Who do I transition that to? And how, what do I need to explain? Do, do I have all the information that they would need to move it forward and so on? So we, I organized a, a, pro, a, like a project, uh, we call it project handoff, but it's more a product handoff uh, session where I ask uh, uh, the product managers to actually um, present the state of their research to an entire audience. And that audience was composed of uh, additional product managers, product owners, technical product owners, we had our developers, our dev leads, architects. We even had managers. They were very interested in the process. So they were attending to uh, see how, what, what was the benefit of it. And when we left the room, it was very, it was very beneficial because they had uh, presented all their requirements, what they had. And the development team was there and was able to ask them a lot of questions, actually. So it was beneficial for the development team to be part of that process early up, um, up front, right, uh, upstream. And it was very interesting for the uh, business analysts and uh, the product managers who did all the assessment work because they get a question that helped them uh, refine their uh, product, refine their requirement. Okay, so. After we had that uh, session, we organized, a week later actually, we organized uh, um, story mapping. And uh, story mapping is actually uh, an exercise, that's what the picture is about. It's an exercise, a workshop, where we actually break down uh, high level functionalities or requirements such as initiative, uh, features, oops, and sometimes uh, um, epics as well, but we like to start. Sometimes we can break down, we can start at the concept, right? 
So uh, what we did, we took the, the work items that we had identified the week before and we worked together. So we had four to five DevOps teams in the room and they broke down uh, their, their features, actually the features that they would be working on. And uh, towards the end of the workshop, we integrated all those uh, plans, actually all those story maps together. So that exercise allowed its one day one day workshop, it allowed us, with all the stakeholders in the room, to have what we call a sprint plan for the next three to four months. So that's huge, right? That's having a sprint plan for three to four months. It's uh, similar to a big room planning. Uh, considering the level of requirements we started off with, we were able to develop that sprint plan for the next three months. So, of course, uh, the user stories, those are user stories actually, of course they were not as detailed and uh, they were not ready to be worked on, but they were refined enough so that everybody in the room understood what the work was about, what was the priorities, we identified the MVP, and when we left the room, we knew what the product was about, and that happened in one day. So we had uh, follow-on meetings, uh, follow-on refinement meetings, of course, but that was a huge achievement. And the organization saw the value of value stream mapping and the business actually started uh, introducing, uh, uh, sorry, uh, story mapping, started introducing story mapping and MVP in almost everything that they do. So it was a huge uh, success. So uh, the outcome of those uh, larger workshops where you bring uh, all stakeholders in the room uh, are we speed the information flow, we speed problem solving because we have the right stakeholders in the room. We, uh, we also uh, saw a speed decision making. We have managers, uh, domain architects, dev leads in the room and we, it, it allows product management to be able to get to some decisions much faster. And we have product management, I work with product managers who are not that comfortable with uh, technology, right? They have a good understanding, but they don't have a technical background. So when we have those meetings, what it, what it fosters, actually what it en encourages the collaboration between product management and development. It's a, a cross-pollination. So they provide product managers information, technical information that help them uh, refine their requirements, refine their features and so on. And they don't need to be technical, but they get the support, they get some information from developers. And what it does uh, in reverse, it allows development actually to develop some uh, uh, empathic skills uh, uh, towards the business, right? It allows development teams, I've seen develop developers really grow well when they were exposed to uh, product management, business stakeholders, and so on. So they get better at uh, doing their demo, for example. They get familiar with the business lingo. They are able to empathize with what the customers want, and they are able to uh, deliver uh, better products, simply because they have that relationship and connection with the business. So it helps uncover a uh, scaling uh, hurdle sooner. So, and I talked about um, delivering product, quality product at scale. So it really helps speed that process of uh, uncovering problems. And um, uh, it speeds the MVP discovery. So that's really important because the MVP, the minimum viable product, we want to find that MVP as soon as possible, right? We want to identify that MVP as soon as possible, and we want to get it to market to get feedback. That's really important because that's how we measure the viability of a product. So the next uh, category of uh, uh, practices, and I love uh, those ones, <laughs> um, it's, uh, I call them feedback velocity. So uh, what, I, what I understand, what I mean by feedback velocity is how soon can we get the feedback from our end users? That's really important, right? The sooner you get feedback, the better fit for purpose your product is going to be. You don't want to work six months on a product, release it, and then get feedback because m most likely it will be obsolete, right? And it's not going to meet your customer's needs. So you want that feedback really as soon as possible. So some of those practices are introduced, and I want to say some of those are not even like standard uh, uh, published practices. It's just 
working with managers, working with software developers and so on, we try to identify what's working, what's not working, and we come up with uh, practices that help fill a gap, a uh, collaboration and communication gap. So at, uh, at uh, Amazon, I did not introduce that. It was there when I joined, a really cool uh, practice, I love it. Uh, weekly customer reviews deep dive. It, it used to be called, um, when I worked at Amazon, uh, reviews deep dive. And uh, we met every Thursday afternoon for two hours, the entire team. So I want to talk about that, actually. That's the example I, I decided to talk about today. Feedback cycle. So uh, feedback cycle time and quick wins, the sprint capacity. So that's a practice on the development team, but we can see how it benefits uh, product management. And I uh, 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 rolled out those two practices at Microsoft with a software, um, uh, with a manager software development. So business shadow or user involvement, uh, so that consists of actually shadowing the business. Uh, at BCU, for example, we had uh, developers I organized what I called um, uh, a business shadow or some organization uh, call it uh, user safari or user involvement. So what we had done at BCU, I asked the business and it's a financial organization, right? Uh, so I, had, I asked the business if some of our development team members could actually shadow them and generally on a Friday uh, afternoon and they spent three to four hours just sitting at uh, some of our operation uh, um, business uh, stakeholders just to see how they use their application. And because I was at the financial center, which was actually a bank, we had real customers, they could see how they use the application we were building, and they could see how they use it when they interact with, the, with real customers. Okay, so that gives them an idea of how, what is it that, uh, they, how what they're developing is actually rolled out, used by uh, end users, what are the challenges, and so on. So it really helps them emphasize with uh, uh, stakeholders, but also get a feedback. So developer rotation, uh, it means um, uh, when, um, like I said, oftentimes um, product management meet with business stakeholders, but alone, right, to un better understand what they want, the ideas, and so on. So what I introduced, I, uh, Expedia, I asked, and it was very well received, actually. I asked if uh, uh, it would be okay to have uh, developers attend business meeting on a rotation basis. We can't have all the development team attend at once, right? That would be impossible to manage. But we introduced uh, the ability of having uh, one developer join the product manager and meet with the business stakeholders. And it was really successful. It really helped the developer. It was very helpful for the product manager as well. So one of the reasons I want to say, one of the reasons why I did that is because during our retrospective, when we conducted retrospective, there are a few feedback that came, came, came up very, quite often. The development team didn't have any visibility to the product roadmap. So uh, some of the feedback that they share is that they didn't really have the, an understanding of the big picture of the product they were working on. So they knew uh, what the features was, were about, the smallest uh, features but they really didn't have any visibility on the vision, the roadmap, even uh, to six months uh, and the four, six, 12 month roadmap. And so some of the feedback they shared in retrospective, it, they really felt like they were just task handlers, right? That was at Expedia in my group. They didn't feel like they were uh, in, um, in integral part of the product uh, development aspect. And that's really something I wanted to solve for. I think it's really important to include them, right? So that's why I introduced the developer rotation. So real-time demo, what we do currently, for example, at T-Mobile, as soon as we develop something, we demo it. We don't wait the end of the sprint. So we work so closely with business stakeholders, with uh, our product management and business stakeholders, that we demo, we can do multiple demo a day, actually. As soon as a feature of user story is developed, uh, we demo it, we share it, we look, uh, the, our business stakeholders can give us feedback right away. So uh, telemetry as well and qualitative feedback. So it's really important when we are a product managers to give that we, we, we product managers are more are exposed. They work daily with the business, right, or uh, um, customers. 
So, and they get that qualitative feedback, not through telemetry or tools, but just um, uh, through conversation. And it's really important to feed that feedback back to the development team, and it doesn't often happen. So I work with the product management and the business to make sure that that happens. So weekly customer reviews deep dive. Uh, so every Thursday was really interesting. Uh, we, uh, um, if you remember, I talked about all the roles involved in the flow of content integration for Kindle periodical. So um, we didn't invite everybody because there would be a lot of people, but we invited, uh, there was managers, uh, TPM, so technology product managers, uh, there were uh, content integration manager, ops uh, uh, managers as well. Uh, I was attending those. So we had uh, probably 10 to diff 15 different people attending those meetings. Not everyone attended every week, but it was weekly. And someone uh, printed the reviews of Kindle periodicals because we had just really started launching periodicals. It was less than a year. And we we're trying to get better, understand the customers, point of view feedback, how it was going. And um, so we literally printed those uh, reviews. We sat together uh, in a round robin, not even behind tables, and we reviewed those. We literally read those reviews. We reviewed them, we commented them, we analyzed them. So what it does, because we all come from different perspectives, remember the unconscious bias and that uh, we, we, we look at people through the lens of their roles and what it allowed us, not only we uh, uh, get, got an alignment and understanding, a shared understanding of what the customer really wanted, the pain points, what they didn't like. Imagine you open your Kindle uh, box, a brand new Kindle box, and you have a review that says, oh, I hate it, just when they open the box. So that's really strange, right? The first, uh, the first 10 minutes or five minutes trying to switch on your Kindle, you don't like it. We want to know, right, those feedback. So that's the reason why we were looking at those uh, feedback every week. And uh, we, it helps us uh, build uh, an understanding across all of the team members who were involved in that process, content integration, tra uh, translation, I was involved in translations as well. And uh, it helps us uh, feed that uh, feedback back into the product backlog. So we give all of that to the product managers. Not all of it was directly related to the work we were doing, but we were able to share that with any stakeholders who could actually bring that back to the, plug that back into their product backlog. So um, those are, it's important to remember that those feedback that we look, uh, we have access to online are provided by people who are gonna be our family are going online, right? But we have a lot of uh, people who don't go online to provide feedback. So another way of getting feedback that's also uh, very valuable, I highly encourage you to look into it. We brought on site customers. So we did that with several companies and at BCU uh, we worked with uh, Pivotal Lab, a software development consulting company. And when I worked with them, uh, we actually every, uh, every week we, had, uh, we recruited uh, real customers who were actually customers of the bank. We invited them on site. They spent the day with us and they tested our product. They gave us feedback, real-time feedback, right? And we plugged that feedback back into the product backlog. So we were on a two-week sprint, but we invited them every week on site and we got that feedback. And during those meetings all day long, we had them interact with the developers as well. So those are some of the practices that are very valuable. And I want to see uh, the several level, several layers of uh, the way we can look at that. The objective is not just to speed the time to market, you know, it's to bring people together, help them understand what products are about, help them build better products, help them empathize with the customers, with the end-to-end -end customers. It's also helping customers understand our work, right, our constraints and so on. So very valuable uh, practices. Uh, so real quick, really quickly, customer feedback, velocity and quick wins. So I work, it was really interesting because uh, in that group at Microsoft, it's actually the software development manager who was really interested in uh, uh, understanding the feedback 
and plugging it back. Not the product managers, interestingly, interestingly, but it was actually the software development manager. So we worked really closely for several months, and we wanted to uh, uh, first get the feedback from customers really fast, but then it's not just getting the feedback, right? It's how fast can we plug it back into the product backlog, and how fast can we uh, deliver it back to the product, uh, to the uh, customers? So we, we came up with a process, I won't go into details, but we measured uh, almost every week. We measured not only uh, how fast we could get their feedback, but how fast we could put it back in the product backlog, how fast we could deliver that feedback back to them, what they wanted back to them. Okay, so that was, that, what that do, it actually helped uh, uh, develop that trust with the customers, reliability, relationship. And it's not just trust with, between product management and uh, the end users, but and the business stakeholders, but it's also uh, across the flow, right, the end-to-end -end flow. It's not, you, I often hear uh, about trust between product management and customer or development and product management. But again, uh, it's not just uh, about trust between groups, it's establishing trust across the end-to-end -end life cycle and value flow. That's really important. So those are the type of practices we did in order to uh, uh, build on that. So quick wins, the sprint capacity goes with actually customer feedback velocity. With another group, that was the global BI uh, operation at Microsoft. We took a step forward, actually, on the feedback velocity. What we did, um, for each sprint, uh, if you're familiar with a sprint, they are generally two weeks. We have a capacity, and um, what we did, we actually uh, capped out a percentage of the sprint capacity for what we call quick wins. So what those are? Those are actually all the feedback. It was a, cap uh, a number of story points uh, dedicated to uh, being able to plug all the feedback we got from the customers right into the sprint. So you're a customer, you give me a feedback. I deliver at the end of the sprint, we deploy. You give me a feedback, but I'm already sprinting, right? Uh, there's no gap between this. I'm already sprinting. I already have my sprint goal. And as you know, we try not to disrupt the sprint goal, or interrupt it, or change it to, for the stability of the team. So we had a capacity. So when we got feedback, our customers didn't have to wait two weeks to get what they wanted right away, right? We had capacity to do that. And it wasn't a large capacity. It wasn't like a, a, a two, three days, right? Because the sprint is literally only 10 days. It was something, if they had feedback that we could deliver within a day, less than a day, a day, we would prioritize it and they would have it right away. So that definitely bridged uh, the relationship between product management, uh, customers, business stakeholders, and the development team. So that feedback velocity is really important. So what it does, first of all, it ensures that you, what you're developing, the product you are putting to market, is a fit for purpose. It really meets and even uh, 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 goes beyond the uh, customer's expectations. Then it speeds the MVP feedback and time to market. I mentioned that the MVP, the feedback is really important on the MVP because it's a prototype, right? So generally it's a, a, a go or no go type of a prototype. If it works, if it's adopted, if it's uh, loved by the customers, we are gonna de develop on it. If it's not, we're not gonna pursue that product and that's the reason why it's really important to get feedback as soon as possible. So it develops empathy across uh, product management and development and it sustains trust. So continuous improvement and learning, I'm gonna go fast on that, all right? So some of the practice, um, again, those are practices across the end-to-end -end flow that involved a lot of our stakeholders, all of the stakeholders across the flow. And some of those practices, so continuous improvement and learning is really important, right, in an agile organization. You want to continuously learn. In fact, if you are here today, I'm sure you're working as product managers, but you are still learning to improve on your skills. And in agile, it's really part of uh, the work that we do every day, right, continuous improvement. It's part of the agile manifesto, inspect and adapt. So uh, some of the practices uh, that are co commonly known, well-documented are uh, organizational big room uh, retrospective, uh, 
product launch retrospective. I introduced that at Amazon, but I haven't seen a lot of retrospectives around that. Uh, product and development leadership retrospective. So what is that? Because uh, you probably heard of team retrospective, but not leadership retrospective, right? And uh, then product management COP, which is community of practice. So I don't know if you have product management community of practice in your organization, where all product managers can actually interact, share best practices, what's working well for them, what's not working well. I introduced that at Expedia and they just loved it and they kept having, having those uh, COPs on a weekly basis during lunch and just because they wanted to be able to share what was working and what not. So um, really quickly, I'm gonna talk about uh, one practice, the product launch retrospective. Actually, I can cover both, but really quickly. The, the um, project launch retrospective, um, um, uh, along with my work on uh, content integration with the periodicals at uh, Amazon, I also worked on uh, launching a Kindle periodical in France, Germany, and Japan. And um, we wanted, for me it was important to, uh, uh, I, I'm very big about uh, retrospective lessons learned. So we were preparing for the launch and I wanted to understand what went well when we launched in the uh, UK before uh, France. And uh, when I had asked, uh, I, I could just start it, when I had asked uh, my colleagues, uh, some of the feedback I heard is it didn't go really well. It went fine, but there was a lot of challenges. We were figuring out a lot of the things as we were launching, right? And that happens often when we start launching a new product, especially globally. So I organized a, a product launch retrospective. Again, I invited most of the stakeholders who were involved in that product launch and asked them what went well and let's celebrate and what didn't go very well and that we want to improve on, and especially around that launch, right? Specifically launch, not the development, but the launch phase. And based on that retrospective, the feedback we got, it was very beneficial. And here, the folks who got a lot of uh, value out of it were more the project managers, the program managers, global program managers, right, who are involved in product launch. But we had product managers as well who attended because it was important for them to understand how it's going and how it's, how, how it's not going well, right? So what, what happened when, uh, when we do something like that, first of all, again, we bring all the key stakeholders on the same page. So we align across a product launch. And then uh, one of the outcome and output is we developed actually a product launch playbook that, was, uh, that we were able to leverage across different uh, groups. A playbook that we were able to leverage when we uh, uh, deployed to France, Germany, and Japan. So when you launch in different countries, there are gonna be differences, right? But we developed common practices and standards so that we were able to deploy in any country. So that was a huge uh, benefit. So product development lead and a product and development leadership retrospective. So at Expedia, um, when I shared some of the challenges that the team had around collaboration with product management, so we were in an organization and that's very common when you work in a medium size or even large size organization. Reorganizations are common, right? And a lot of organizations now are merging or combining, bringing together product and uh, software development. So when I was at Expedia, for example, that was the time where we started merging a product management organization with a software development. And those are the times where it creates some uh, challenges, right? Because you have to collaborate with a brand new group, a brand new uh, type of people, right? Product management, software development. So uh, there was a little bit of friction and uh, challenges uh, due to culture. And then the um, software development team uh, had shared a lot of feedback around the fact that they didn't feel part of the product, right? So I was working with for a director that was extremely familiar with Agile. I think it's really awesome when you have a leadership support who understand what we're trying to do. So I worked with a director who really knew Agile well, and when I shared those feedback, he told me, and that was amazing to me because I never heard that in my entire career. He says, Sharon, I want to know what's going on on the team. I want to support them. I want to know what the challenges are, and I want to, bri to bridge those gaps, right? And I was very surprised. I said, wow, this is amazing, and because he was director. 
And I heard the same feedback from the software development director. So I had two directors in my organization, software development and product management, and they both wanted to know what was going well on the product management side. I was working with product managers and what was, what was going well or not on the development side. And they asked me to organize a retrospective, a leadership retrospective, where we would showcase, where we would look at all those uh, challenges that was brought by the team. So as you know, the retrospectives are considered to be confidential to the team, right? I worked as a scrum master with a lot of teams and um, we prefer not to share those feedback. And if we do, uh, I ask the team, hey, this is the situation. We have leadership, they want to help us. Are you okay uh, sharing those feedback? And they were fine actually for most of the case, they wasn't, uh, on the contrary, they wanted help. So we organized that leadership retrospective and this is one of the picture actually. And uh, one of the first leadership retrospective, we had senior directors, directors, we have product managers, and we had only one uh, lead developer or software development manager actually. We didn't have anybody under management, uh, but we had product manager. And it was amazing because they were all invested in bringing product management and software development together. And we did it for the first time and we kept doing it every two, two weeks, every sprint. So every sprint they wanted to hear what the feedback was. And what they did, I did not ask them to do that, which was amazing. They took the, 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 um, the easel sheets, uh, we organized all the impediments by a must solve by priority order, what we wanted to solve first, and they put that on their wall. They had offices with windows and they literally put that, we developed a Kanban and they wanted to address all of those challenges and they wanted to be held accountable by the team. So they put that on their window and if the team did not see how those impediments were moving from to do, working progress and done, the development team or the product managers were literally entitled to ask them, okay, hey, uh, how, is this, how is this progressing? <laughs> To conclude, uh, I talked about, uh, we looked at um, a lot of practices that can help influence uh, your organization, right? The way people work together, the way different roles collaborate and different roles in product management and software development. So uh, as we are uh, transforming, as every company is transforming towards becoming more digital, uh, we face a lot of challenges when it comes to the organizational structure and scaling, right? And also working together. So um, here you can see two types of organizations and that's not the only two types that exist. I would say that could be the extreme, right? So we have centralized uh, organizations and those cent centralized organizations are, are generally have a, a, a strong hierarchy and uh, they are centralized and which result in rigidity and silos. So uh, you will see a clear delineation and boundaries between roles, uh, different titles, overlaps and so on. And uh, their business mindset is more focused on what I call L2, so legacy and uh, low risk. Okay, so they are I'm not saying they are risk averse, they don't want to innovate and uh, dis disrupt uh, uh, their industry, but they are more focused on legacy. And I work at some companies like that, by the way. And uh, the trade-offs is there's a clarity, you know, there's role clarity, there's you know who, who you need to talk to, you know what you need to do, but it's not just about knowing what we have to do, it's also being able to you know, uh, go beyond what we have to do, right? Especially when we try to innovate. So the trade-off is that those organizations are slow. And uh, then we have a, a, a form of organizations that are actually becoming more prominent. Uh, it's, the, it's the minority, all right? It's not the majority what we call uh, the freed or connected organization. So there's another word for those organizations that uh, we also call them liquid. You may have heard the word liquid organizations. 
So I, I personally don't like the word liquid too much. I prefer fluid because it reminds me of the flow of value. And one way to represent or to um, define of those organization that uh, scholars, uh, researchers, and people have used is um, the murmuration of uh, a bird a flock. So if you have time, if you have interest, I highly recommend you to look at the videos. There's lots of videos that actually show uh, a bird's mur murmuration. And what is it is you can see a really large flock of birds flying together in coordination, in uh, formation, and they are able to uh, shift, pivot in seconds all together. You know? So that's really amazing. And that's actually very beautiful and really amazing. So those organizations, they are not necessarily structured very differently than other organizations. It's just the way we are uh, working together, we are thinking together, the practices that we are using, such as the one I, I mentioned to you, that are around open space agility. So, and because we are all working together, we are understanding what we're doing, and we are able to empathize with each other, we are able to pivot much faster, right? So those organizations, the fluid organization leads to agility or are focused on agility, flow, and interconnections between groups and people. And they obsess over what I call C2, so culture and customer. For me, it's not just the customer that's important, it's also the employees. And in fact, there are more research now that are showing that um, the, what we call the ENPS, so the employee net promoter score is as important as the customer net promoter score. And there's a direct relationship between both. So uh, those companies are also obsessed over culture and people, their people. And then they are fast, uh, but the trade-off is they need adaptive systems. So uh, hierarchy and so on, it's really difficult to function and be free and fast in organizations that uh, uh, focus uh, on a hierarchy. And the last uh, slide, the product management skills for the connected enterprise. So how can you be successful in those organizations, right? Um, so the, the, the way product management is uh, evolving and it requires not only product, hardcore product management skills, you know, what, what's, what your competency is, but it also requires to agility to be agile, to think in terms of agility. And what that means is, uh, Embrace, it means to be able to embrace complexity, complexity of organizational structure. It's uh, navigate that complexity and not try to actually simplify it and uh, silo it, right? And this is the way we tend to process information, but it requires to be really comfortable with complexity and engaging multiple people, diverse people in order to deliver uh, great products. So the next thing is the product mindset. So it's really important to think about your product beyond your role and beyond your group. This is what we call business model innovation, not just innovation or product innovation. We want to, uh, uh, I'm interested in disrupting industries, right? I'm interested in uh, not just developing features on top of features, but looking at the core operation model of, our, of an organization on my group. And to do that, we have to engage different stakeholders, right? We have to look at the, our core system, how we really work, and it's not just software development, it's also business model, business practices, processes, workflows. And uh, so we have to look at uh, our project beyond just our group and our role, but uh, look at uh, um, uh, innovating our business model, changing our business model. And uh, finally, probably my favorite, <laughs> because I'm probably, I probably fit in that uh, group, lead without a title, okay? What I do is actually very difficult. It's not easy because I go talk to so many people across an organization and so someone asked me, it's good information for you, but Sharon, how do you do that? You know, how do you have the drive to go and you're not scared? And, and I replied, I'm scared actually, you know, I, I received, um, <laughs> 
I, I, it, it's challenging, but I have to do it because what's important is to bring people together. It's important for product management to understand the work of a software development. You don't need to be technical, but you have to understand what is it that they need to be set up for success and what is it that you need from them to be set up for success, right? So lead without a title, bring people along, pivot together as a team, not just product management alone, and then influence uh, organizational effectiveness. That means even if you don't work for an organization that is like a fluid or liquid organization, you can influence your organizational effectiveness. Voila. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>